Hello and welcome to episode 245 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. I am your host, Mark the Green Tank, and with me as always are my fellow tankards, tanks, Tanker. Neil the Orange Tank, hello, and Kellen the Red Tank. This is a comment about my weight. I won't respond to it. <laughs> Isn't a tankard like a another name for a mug? I mean, yeah, it's kind of more of a comment on our drinking habits, I think. Yeah, which are wildly out of control as well. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a fat tank to me. Today's episode is going to be in Essen 2022 Spectacular, where we're going to be going over the top five games that we're excited to hear about from Essen. We won't be at Essen ourselves. We'll be at the much, much better Shucks 2022. So take that, Essen. <laughs> Do you think he's listening? Essen? Mr. Yeah. Essen? I think Essen's a Patreon, isn't he? I feel sort of bad. At which level? I uh, Just like $3. Oh, so yeah. F- we Essen. Know. Yeah, f- Essen. <laughs> People bring you all those games, and all you can contribute is $3. Anyhow, yet, despite the fact that Shucks is the better convention, a lot of people do bring new games to Essen. And so we are going to be talking about the five games from Essen that we are most excited to hear about, to play, that we've seen buzz about, and we are uh, looking forward to getting our hands on or, again, hearing more about. But, but before we get to that, we're going to be talking about the games we have played Neilan is going to talk about Plutocracy, and I'll be talking about Finca. Neilan, is Plutocracy about Pluto? And I'll be providing (laughs) talking. (laughs) Yes, Callum will be providing flavor commentary. Plutocracy is at least a little bit about Pluto. Okay, I literally know nothing about this game. This is a game that appropriately will be at Essen, so, you know, that's some timing for you right there, which is also appropriate because, as Callum so aptly reminded me, Space is time, is money, is power. That is the slogan for this game. And actually a pretty apt, like, quick summary of the game's mechanics to some extent. This is designed by Claudio Berig and was sent to us by Double Dank Spiel as a review copy. And the premise of this game is that you're effectively just, like, space traders or space influencers is not the right word i was going for but you there is a <laughs> content think of a creators multi- in space <laughs> content creators in space no think of the solar system as now like a multi-planet society you are traveling around the solar system picking up resources from each of the different planets flying to another planet where that resource might be in demand selling it using that money to buy seats on each of the councils of these planets which is sort of like an area control game and all of this is in service of getting votes on the plutocratic council which effectively serves as victory points whoever has the most members on the council at the end of the game wins but where this gets pretty interesting is it's not just a simple map of these planets that you travel between. The planets are all constantly in motion. So this uses a timing mechanism similar to something like a patchwork, where whoever has used the least time so far takes the next turn, which means you know if you're using your time efficiently, you can theoretically take multiple turns in a row. And every 10 time steps, all of the planets rotate around their orbits. So there's this idea of you might want to travel to a location where the planet is going to be just as it's about to move in order to be more efficient in your movement. Because every time you take a move action and you must move every single turn, that's going to cost you time. Oh. There we go. Space space is time, time is money, is power. Money is power. And that's how you win the game. See? See, it all works. This had the potential to be overly complicated, but there's not really that much to the game Mechanically, the systems are really, really simple. On your turn, you're going to be taking steps in order, which are as simple as sell the only resource that is sellable to that planet you're on, buy the only resource that is available from that planet you're on. If you want to spend money on votes, do that, and then move to another planet, spending time to do so. There is one other little, let's call it a mini game that is layered on top of this, which is about these four different objectives that you're sort of racing for. One of them to rescue these aliens from this asteroid that's about to crash into the sun. One just to spread out your influence across these planets. And the reason you're racing for these is when you get back to Earth, which is another little planet which is obviously orbiting fairly close to the sun, you 
are competing to be the first person to join these societies, which are a, a large number of votes on the plutocratic council. So there's like these competing objectives, trying to find the ideal times to buy and sell high, looking at the way that the events are going to play out so you can time your actions just before the next election happens, for example, the next price adjustment. So there's a lot of just like looking at the time and working out the most optimal routes between planets in order to both beat people to the punch on like, you know, good priced items and beat them to the cheaper seats on the council. That's kind of the gist of it. I thought this was surprisingly good. We had some concerns early on where money just seemed really incredibly tight. But I think that one of the things that's quite clever about the game is as it sort of was evolving and as we were figuring out the rhythms of it, we got to the point where we were like, oh, we suddenly are like flush with cash. But it more becomes critical about how to find the time to use that money appropriately. So there's just a very cool trade-off as the game evolves and you're watching the planets sort of line up and misalign and sort of timing that appropriately. I thought this was really cool. I think the production leaves a little bit something to be desired. It, it yeah, definitely it's very has the, dark. It's very yeah, cool it's looking. a very simple... I don't think that the, the graphic design is necessarily all the way there. It's pretty clear. I think that there are some color issues between like some of the red and orange colors that tripped people up at times. But otherwise, you're selling red resources to the red planet, green resources to the green planet. So they utilize color effectively in that regard. But yeah, it's a very simple looking board. I think it could have just used a little bit more dressing up. They needed more space. Needed more space and more time. Because maybe. the time and then the I, money. Is money, which is... No, no, not the power. Then with the oh, money, the they power. could hire more appropriate graphic design. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that is plutocracy. No, uh, I have a question. I, I oh, have yeah. a real question instead of just derailing, which, you know, you did tell me at the beginning that my job this episode was just color commentary. Uh -huh. So I'm happy to do that. You mentioned sort of the movement of there's some sort of pre-planning or the way in which you move is not super intuitive not that it's not intuitive but it's not just i want to go there and now i go there there's a little yeah. bit of forward planning you have to do is that the game or is you know for instance if you could just move wherever you wanted anytime you like i like the idea of buy low sell high things are changing you know and you're sort of zipping around the galaxy doing that that sounds fun but how much of the game is buried in sort of the pre-planning of it if you got rid of that stuff would it be just way 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 too straightforward I think so. I'm not going to go as far as saying that's the entirety of the game because so much of it is like market timing and, and market manipulation to some extent. But that is all very much buried in the fact that you have to be aware of where things are going to line up at the appropriate times. Like, for example, like if I'm going to buy a boatload of carbon from one planet, but then the planet that I need to sell it to, and there is only one planet that you can sell it to, is on the other side of the sun, then you've probably messed up. You know, like even yeah. though the market might be in your favor in that point, it's not going to work out in terms of your ability to sell that quickly. So it definitely is a core component, but it's one of a couple of considerations. Because the other side of that also is depending on how much time another player has spent, you might be able to beat them to the punch, even though you're doing actions after them just because of the way that the planets line up in your favor at the time where you'll be able to take your next turn. So it's definitely a pretty heavy consideration, I would say, for sure. Yeah. Okay, Mark, in edit, you don't have to do this, but if you wanted to do this, anytime Neelan uses the word space, time, money, or power, if there was sort of this echo effect where the other three words are said, <laughs> like, in less, because space is time is money is power, they're all the same, right, is right. what I'm reading right. here. It's like So you're saying the first word in the list is normal. Yeah, and, and then time, yeah. money power <laughs> but you're gonna need three different effects right because then when it says time it needs to do space money power can i just use that little clip you've provided me and then when you do money then when you do money right it's got to be space time power right and then the last one right i'm not sure if you get the pattern yet but <laughs> i'll do it again for you here when sure when neon says power then you say space Time, money. Okay, <laughs> that seems. Right? Uh, yeah, that's, no, I love it. That's Paul. doable. Yeah, it's doable. Not only doable, but completely worth it. So I love every aspect of this. And don't f around and just use my sh work in progress. No, no, no. I'm gonna have the team on that. I'm gonna have the okay. Our, Put the guys on it. Yeah, our top team on that. Get sure. all the audio engineers involved. Yeah, that is. Them. 
Plutocracy by Doppeldang Spieler. After searching for this game for a couple of years now, I finally got a chance to get and play Finca, a game originally published in 2009 by Wolfgang Senker and Rolf Zur Lind and published by Franjos Spieler Log. Finca is a game about fruit collecting, and when you hear me say fruit collecting, you probably imagine the super colorful board with vibrant, maybe plastic fruit pieces, but remember, this is a game from all the way back in 2009, the Dark Ages. No, this is a game that does have a very, very strong old Euro aesthetic, and that's not a bad thing at all. While the board is colorful, it isn't the like day-glow array of colors you might expect. Things are certainly a little more earthy, got more brown and green tones, as you might expect from an older Euro game. But it does have these really, really fun wooden pieces shaped in the six types of fruit found on the island, which you'll be collecting. These are almonds, olives, oranges, which frankly aren't the most exciting looking fruits. They're just a circle, really. Grapes, lemons, and Kellen's favorite, the fig. Kellen, for all those listening, big fig guy. Wouldn't expect it, but big fig guy. What? Is this, <laughs> okay. is this because I ate a Fig Newton one time in front of you? <laughs> the way it works is that you'll start the game by constructing a rondelle, which is, uh, for those who don't know, basically like a, a pie-looking thing. Each slice of this pie, which is an apt analogy given this game is all about fruit, <laughs> is going to depict one of the aforementioned fruits. So you're making this rondelle, this like pie-looking thing, where you'll have two slices that have lemons on them, two have oranges, two have almonds, but it's randomly made each time you play the game. You'll also have, I think, four or five workers, I think depending on play count, spread along this rondelle. And the way your turn normally works is that first you'll pick one of your workers, or farmers, I guess they are, and then you'll, you have to move them Along the rondelle, the number of spaces equal to the number of farmers that were on the section of the rondelle when you started. So, for example, if you start your turn on a fig spot and there were two other farmers there, and they can be either your own farmers or your opponents, then you must move the farmer you pick up from that spot three spaces, one for every person that was on it when they started moving. Then, wherever you land, you get as many pieces of that fruit as there are farmers when you get there. So, in the above example... If after you move those three spaces, you landed on a grape spot and there were already four farmers there, you would get a grand total of five grapes, four for the farmers that were already on there and the fifth one for having your farmer land on it. There's also this fun mechanism where if you land on a spot and you're owed more of a type of fruit that is in the supply, everyone must return all the fruit of that type back to the supply and then you get paid out. So it's a way to punish hoarders of a particular type of fruit. Callan, for example, will be hoarding the figs. But also a nice little edge in an otherwise very family-friendly game. You can't have a monopoly on a resource? No, you cannot. For that reason, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I can see uh, Kellen thinks he's Mark Cuban now. Anyhow, you're doing all this to fulfill contracts that are randomly stacked all around the island. And on your turn, instead of getting more fruit, if you've acquired a donkey tile, which you get by crossing the halfway points of this rondelle... Then you can make a delivery and exchange the fruit you've been getting for the tiles, which give you points. There's a little bit more to it than that. Some set collection, a touch of like special abilities, but really not that much more than what I've just explained. This feels like a perfect, your family or non-board gaming friends are interested in, in a fun looking game that's easy to teach and not super long, but with interesting choices and a little bit of, uh, of bite. It plays in about 45 minutes and probably would be even faster for experienced players, though the setup and teardown can take a little bit of time with all the setting up of the rondelle and all the stacks of tiles for uh, the recipe fulfillment. I'm not sure experienced players would want to play this game if it took 60 to 90 minutes because it's fairly light, but at 45, it's a perfect sort of warm-up game to a game night. Felt a lot like Karuba in that way to me, which is a game that we often will play as we're waiting for folks to, to show up. But I think this game will really shine with folks wanting something in the ticket-to-ride weight and approachability. It's a really fun game, one that I feel confident I'd be able to teach in six months, even if I didn't pick it up again in the meantime, because it's just that straightforward and simple to teach. Another classic low rules threshold, high choices type of game, sort of throwback Euro that I'd, I'd recommend. So that is Finca. Kellen, you said you might have played this in the past? I did. I think I played this in New York way back in ye olden days of, you know, like 2013. I wonder how high it peaked on BGG because I'm sure it was relatively high. This is a pretty well-known older one. Uh, yeah. I think the Rondell was fresher at the time. 
And that may be some of where the fun was, but it's definitely lighter than it looks when you're looking yeah. at it on BGG, I feel like. And unfortunately, it was, I think, out of print for quite a while and still is maybe a little bit hard to come by, not as hard as it used to be a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, that might have also hurt its popularity, just hard to get a, a copy of it. If you're listening to this episode, the day it is released, we are maybe, are we at Shucks already? Are you guys arriving on Thursday? I, mean, I think Kel and I will be there on Thursday, right? What time are you getting in, Mark? Or when are you getting I'm in? getting Friday morning. So two thirds of us will already be in Vancouver and I will be about to be in Vancouver. I'll be the much anticipated main act that is going to be showing up the next day. But nevertheless, if you're at Shucks, this is just a heads up that we are going to be doing three events at Shucks, not to mention the sort of ancillary things, but we are going to be on the main stage three times. So first, Friday night at nine o'clock, we are going to there be only with... one stage. What? Is there, there's only one. It is stage, the main right? stage, okay. Kellen. It is the main stage. That's regardless little... of the number of stages. Hubris. You know what I'm saying? Look, before my meal, I'm eating one hamburger. It is my main hamburger, right? It's your ma- main it hamburger? It is my main hamburger. Don't think about it too much. I've never Anyhow, said that. Okay. So we are going to be on the biggest stage at Shucks. <laughs> First on Friday night at 9 o'clock, playing Hundreds of Horses, but with a twist. We don't know actually know what the twist is, but we'll be playing that with the wonderful Shut Up and Sit Down crew. So that is The twist exciting. is... They're going to try to win, which they've never done before, versus us in any competition. Yeah, I think they might be over. Not that I want to bring that up just before we go, but I think if I look back at my records, which I keep extensive records of every game that I've ever played, including with Shep Sit Down, I think they're over against us. Anyhow, that'll be at 9 o'clock on the, again, the biggest stage you can find at Shucks. That is Hundreds of Horses with a Twist with Shut Up and Sit Down and Board Game Barrage. Then, the next day, we are going to be meeting up with our comrades in arms. Rivals. Slash rivals, slash friendly rivals. So very wrong about games. This will be again on the main stage at 2.30 on Saturday afternoon. This has been billed as Battle of the Pod Boys, which uh, makes a lot of sense if you think about it. (laughs) So that'll be uh, really fun. We're going to be doing that again at 2.30 with the guys at So Very Wrong About Games. And then finally, at 7 p.m. on Saturday night... We are going to be joined with the one and only Tom from Shut Up and Sit Down, who made a fabulous debut on our podcast in our top 10 episode. Probably what he's most famous for. I think so. I think it's right up there. I think it's certainly on his his CV, as they would say in England. The Sin Zone. That will be on, again, Saturday night at 7 o'clock, where we'll be recording our episode. Our next episode of the podcast will be recorded there. So if you want to get in early and listen to the episode before it's released to the masses, all you got to do is get to Vancouver, buy a ticket to the show, and show up at 7 o'clock. Couldn't be easier. So we are super, super, super excited about that. At least I am. Are you guys? I am very excited. Yes, I am excited to see my lover boy, Tom, that's right. Or is it Mother Boy or Lover Boy? It was it's it both. Milk Boy. It's both. It oh, it was Milk Boy. He's all three of those boys to me. <laughs> My main boy. So that is going to be us at Shucks. If you're at the show, certainly uh, I would recommend coming to those shows because we would love to have as many folks there as possible. I would also recommend joining our Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. There is a Shucks channel that we have created for those who are going to be at the show or interested in following along if you're not able to make it to the show. And we'll be organizing, I'm sure, plenty of games there to play with listeners and all the people at that wonderful event. And if you want to organize a game with us, we would love to. And Mark's cell phone number is... The thing I love about that is Kellen used my actual numbers, forcing me to actually go and make sure that I... I Once again, that number is... (laughs) (laughs) All right. That is shucks. But you know what's not shucks? Essen. Blah. Blah. Essen. That's what I say when I think about Essen and Shucks. When I think about Essen by itself, I'm like, okay, Essen. When I think about Essen versus Shucks, like, blah, Essen. <laughs> but, but, again, as I mentioned before, people bring their new games to Essen to show to everyone. And so we are going to be going over our five most anticipated games at Essen. So let's start it right up. Kellen, what is your fifth most anticipated game from Essen? 
All right, my fifth most anticipated game of Essen comes to us from the Horrible Guild, which is a prominent publisher who did The King's Dilemma. And I believe this game is co-designed by one of the designers of King's Dilemma. This game is called The Great Split. I am chasing the condensed I Split You Choose game that is sort of in that mid-weight, sub-hour range, but still full of interesting decisions. And The Great Split could be that game. To start us off, it has a beautiful art... Well, we learned last week, Art Deco? Deco? Sure. No, don't sure oh, me. I no, want to Deco, sound smart. Deco. Okay, but not, not, it's not a Not pun. with a K. This is just the regular Art Deco. Uh-huh. So I Split You Choose. It's very simple, very straightforward. There's a couple games that have used this that are just a little too light for me. But essentially, you get an envelope. You have some amount of cards, five or six. You split that down the middle, and then you pass that envelope. And the next player has to choose which of the sides of the I Split that they want. And then every player has their own player board that you can see in front of you and this is a double layered player board it's quite beautiful um, if you guys are looking at this and each scoring each color each type of resource that you're getting has a different style of scoring in a way that looks a little like a mini Ganshan clever style board or a little bit like what is that reiner game that makes me sound smart mila fiori mila fiori because i can pronounce it right that's how i sound smart you know and then we and then mark edits it so that i only say the right one because I couldn't let people know that I don't know how to pronounce Mila Fiore. Um, So beautiful production, double layered boards. Love, love the cover. Just excited about the I Split You Choose mechanism and feeling like I've never gotten the one that I want, even though I love the mechanism itself. My fifth most anticipated game, The Great Split. This game looks good. Did you guys look it up? I really like the cover. Yeah, I like the way it looks as well. I think the art style is like super clean. Yeah, production looks great. Neelan, what's your number five? Yeah, my number five game is my traditional fifth pick, Wild Card, which is Time Capsules. And this game looks stupid as hell in the best possible way. You're like uh, laughing. This... <laughs> I can what's see that? your face. You're like smiling super <laughs> wide. I'm like, what? I can't, what's wrong? It, if you have not looked at this, I can't wait for you to look at this. Because what you're doing in this game is you have a cloth bag. And in that bag, you have these little plastic time capsule shells. And on your turn, you're going to pull out two of those plastic shells, burst them open, and we go, oh my god, look at all the goodies that are inside of this thing. And those are going to be the resources that you're using on your turn. You're going to use those resources to play your tableau, to generate more resources, and then you're going to take some of the things that you produce and put them back into your time capsules, close them up, and put them back in your bag and shuffle them up for a later turn. So every turn, it's a fun little surprise of all the things that you're going to get. That's amazing. <laughs> it's kind of a dumb gimmick, but it sounds pretty fun, right? Is this a f- gotcha game? <laughs> it's a gotcha game in the board game form, exactly. Neela, no. Why are you so happy? <laughs> but one of the things also I loved about this when I was reading through the rules is as you're generating these things, one of the things you can generate are temporal break tokens. And if you get too many of those, you risk thematically ruining the fabric of space time, which means at the end of the game, if you have too many of those, you just lose. You're just eliminated, which is always fun. I love dumb stuff like that in the game where you're sort of trying to manage something and then there's a fun reveal of whether you just straight up lost or not and are eliminated it seems silly it seems goofy it seems also fairly short it's about an hour long game with a fun little mechanic that is time capsules i can't get over these like plastic easter egg components (laughs) it's hilarious yeah i'm gonna wait for the anime waifu edition but (laughs) looks cool my fifth most anticipated game for sn 2022 is from days of wonder so I can't remember what their big release was last year, but they were known for making a, like one big lavish release per year. The release this year is Heat, Pedal to the Metal. So I'm interested in this for a couple of reasons. One, it's got a, a large player count. It's a racing game, and I always like racing games. I've also played a lot more automobiles this year, which is a fantastic 
bag builder and just have sort of like enjoyed playing car racing games this year. And so Heat, as the title implies, is another racing game. This is by the designer of Flamme Rouge, so knows their stuff when it comes to racing. And just Days of Wonder, while the recent releases may not have hit the heights as some of the earlier ones, when they release a game, you know it's going to be solid. The art is by Vincent Dutre and looks lovely. But I just like the idea of a family weight well-designed racing game by the same designer who released Flamme Rouge. So Heat Pedal to the Metal is my fifth most anticipated game of Essen 2022. It's like, don't you feel like Downforce dragged you down? It did. It did. So I played Automobiles first. Really, really liked that. Then Downforce dragged me down, right? Yeah. Then Flamme Rouge picked me back up a little bit, right? And then Automobiles. Flamme Boring? I like Flamme Rouge. I like Flamme Rouge. And then I was elevated even more by my repeated plays this year of automobiles, and now I'm fully geared. I've got my pedal to the metal for pedal to the metal. And it's getting hot, apparently. Or no, I am excited for heat pedal to the metal. It's just, there's something where you see the theme, you're like, yeah, they tried to trick me with downforce. It worked for like a year, and then I got rid of downforce. But again, yeah. I, the pedigree that you're describing with Days of Wonder, I'm like, okay. And my biggest problem with Downforce is that it's like mostly a betting game than an actually a racing game, which was always the bummer to me. Yep. My number four most anticipated game of Essen is me walking the walk. You know, people say, oh, you talk the talk, you know, Kellen, but you're not much of a walker. And I say again, Mark, I'm not a tankard. Okay, if I walk more, I'll be just a regular tank. No, there is a new team game coming out this year from the publisher Fuhrland Spiel, which I believe was Uwe Rosenberg founded this publisher. And I believe often Capstone takes their games, if I'm not mistaken, and publishes them in America. This game is four player only. Uh, Oh, God, another word I'm not going to be able to say. La Famille. How do you say family in Italian? Famille. La Familia? Is it with a G? That's fine. La Familia. I think it's just like a soft, uh, silent G. La Familia, the Great Mafia War. Um, So this is a teams of two taking control of Sicily, mafia families, special abilities. I don't know a whole lot about it. I know that there already is a forum thread, which is hilarious, talking about whether there's any information that you have hidden from your teammate. And it appears that there is no difference between what you know and what your teammate knows, meaning couldn't this just be a one versus one game? No, it's only playable with four players, best with four. I like the art style. I like the length of it. It just looks fun. Something I am excited to try and support team games. My fourth most anticipated game going to spiel is Applejack by, speaking of Uwe Rosenberg, This is a simple tile laying game that feels like it's going to be closer to something like a Nova Luna, but except without the sort of like the race element, but has that puzzly tile laying feel. It's a hexagonal board. Everyone has their own individual board. You're drafting a tile and placing it on your board. And what you're trying to do is line up either apple varieties in order to get more of a specific type of apple, which is going to be worth points at the end of the game, or beehives, because... Kellen, just like in plutocracy, beehives is bees is honey is apples, is exactly what the rules book says. Oh my god. Here's another interesting fact from the rule book, Kellen. Did you know that the apple we as we now know it is the orchard apple? And it belongs to the large family of rose plants and therefore not only related to the roses, but also to strawberries, cherries, plums, almonds, and pears. The rule book has a very long section on the history of apples, so enjoy that. But otherwise the game itself feels pretty simple like i implied you're sort of choosing between whether you're going to be collecting honey which is your main resource in this game or lining up scoring and there's kind of like a hey if i orient these hexes in specific ways i'm going to be getting more apples lined up or more honey lined up you're going to keep doing this until everyone fills their board and whoever has the most points based on their apple collections wins seems pretty simple seems pretty puzzly very much in line with a lot of my favorite life uve games so yeah that's applejack Neil, in any sense, you know, I know he went on a run there with Nova Luna to Sagani to Framework. Is this the hexagonal version of Nova Luna Sagani Framework, or is there some It doesn't seem like it, yeah, because it doesn't have that same sort of, you know, all of those games rely on kind of like the interconnected, like creating chains in multiple directions. It doesn't yeah. really have that. It just feels like in the same weight ballpark more than anything. 
Cool. Well, I dismissed this one uh, just based on the connection to the cereal, so um, <laughs> I'm excited to uh, try this one. My number four most anticipated game is chiefly on the list because of the designer and because it, it sort of harkens back to a game of his that we enjoy quite a bit, which is Rise and Fall, a game by Christoph Boulanger, the designer of Archipelago. This looks like, and I know Living Planet was sort of a dip for him back into the Archipelago sort of style of game, but this looks more along those lines. And I know Living Planet was sort of uh, underwhelming, but Rise and Fall, like, again, looks like a area majority sort of area influence civilization building game where you are starting with a little village and you're going to try to expand out. I just really enjoy his take on that multiple economy civilization expansion game in Archipelago, and I'm interested to see what his latest take is on that with Rise and Fall. Again, looks quite a bit like Archipelago, and while it's a game that we really enjoy, there are some rough edges, which is part of its charm, so I'm just curious to see if those rough edges have been sanded down and therefore are maybe a little more plain, or if they've been refined and they're more interesting. So if you're going to tell me that the designer of Archipelago is coming up with a game that looks like Archipelago Part 2, I'm very interested. So that is Rise and Fall as my number four most anticipated game. It is like when you look at images of this, just pure visual cocaine for my brain. <laughs> like I just look at it and I just want it. You know what I right. mean? Like there's not yeah. many. It's like, ooh, there's Hexit. Ooh, you know, like, ooh. Yeah. Like it's like I keep looking at the images and I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. And I know nothing about the game beyond the designer and those those pictures. Yeah. I thought the analogy you are going to use where it was figs rather than... But it's fine. <laughs> I was actually wondering if I could say, like, biography, but then I'm right. like, this is a family show. That's true. That's true. My number three most anticipated game, I always, I always look at Amigo card games. You just can't stop me. These are sub-hour-long games. They've got simple rules. A lot of times they're in the Kakerlakan family, and this one is not in the Kakerlakan family, which I wonder strategically if that was intentional. But in addition to being an Amigo card game, small box card game, it is designed by Wolfgang Kramer, who has designed two card games that I super love, one of which is Six Nymphs, ultra popular, another that is a little less popular but is excellent, is Linko. And this game... Oh my God, another name that I'm not going to be able to pronounce. What is this? I'm sure it's German for hot sauce. Sauce Scharf? S A U S Scharf? Don't look at me. <laughs> Neelan. It's about making hot sauce. How do you spell it? I don't know. S A U S. Like it sounds. C H A R F. Scharf Scharf. Scharf Scharf. Scharf Scharf. Okay. Here's the thing, okay? If you didn't think that that was enough to deserve the number three spot on my list, Mark, have I got some cocaine for you? This Give game has two phases. Oh, okay. You got me. Two you phase got me. game, making hot sauce, simple card game. You're putting cards in rows. There's numbers on them. Who the f*** knows what's going on with Sarsoff? But it's designed by Wolfgang Kramer. It's an Amigo published game. It's two phases under an hour. I talked to the Amigo rep. I'm going to just send me all of the games, even without <laughs> English rule books. I'll figure out how to play them. I'm very excited. This is right in my wheelhouse. It's like a fastball down the middle. I want more Sharshoff in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Amigo card games are generally winners for me. So, um, yeah, that's one that was not on my radar. Right yeah, you d- yeah, it's because you passed over it. You're like, I don't know how to say Sharshoff. I'm yeah. not going to look at that one. If I can't pronounce it, I don't want to play it. That's what I, my usual take is. Yeah, that's the difference between you and I. Sort of um, open mindedness. I'm willing to put it all on the line. That's true. My third most anticipated game is called Oros by Brunt Brinkerhoff. I wasn't able to find rules for this, so it, it's a bit hard to ascertain exactly the way that this flows. But the premise is kind of that you have this shared map, this sort of shared island space, you know, an open ocean covered in these like island tiles. And the actions on your turn 
are going to be all about manipulating those tiles around the board. So let's call it slide puzzle style, just for the sake of simplicity, where your actions are going to be pushing these tiles, you know, either horizontally or vertically. And as islands start to collide, they start to change the landscape in different ways. So if you push a volcano into another volcano, you create a new island space. If you push islands into each other, you eventually create mountains. And you're going to want to be able to build on these mountains in order to ascend up the ziggurat. So it's this shared puzzle that all the players are manipulating in different Different ways, but you're trying to manipulate you to your advantage to capitalize on the ter- terrain that gets created before other players do. It just seems like a cool idea. I love the clean look of this. It's got just a very stylized, cartoony, vibrant color palette. And very, very interested to find out more about this. Well, the one thing that is intriguing about it is that the player action board seems more complex than that description I just gave allows. So there's some level of hidden complexity here that I'm not really clear about, but very interested to find out more about Aros. Yeah, this is one of the coolest covers. I flagged it just for the cover, then got into what it is, and I'm like, oh, there's a slide (laughs) puzzle here. I'm not going to like this. But that cover is very striking. Yeah, very, very, very vibrant. My number three game is, like Kellen, a card game. This is Tribes of the Wind, which is also the second Vincent Dutre game, I believe that's on my list. Looks like a simple card game with a twist that I'm sort of interested in. You play your cards, it seems sort of Hanabi style, where part of your cards are visible to your opponents. And from what I understand, the ability to play your cards and the strength of the cards that you're going to play in this game are based on the backs of the cards that your opponents have in their hands. So it's like some sort of variable thing where there may be more opportune or less opportune times to play cards based on the cards that your opponents are holding. And I just like that sort of That give and take on, hey, this might be a card that works now, but based on what my opponents are holding, it's not going to be that powerful or it is going to be powerful. And it just feels like it has the potential of being a a tight card game a la Arboretum and stuff like that that I really enjoy without being too complicated. So my third most anticipated game is Tribes of the Wind, which has a really, speaking of of covers, a a cover that that jumped out at me uh, as I was scrolling through the games on this list. Totally excited for this one, too. I think I posted a picture of this in the Discord, and I was just like, look at this, like a couple months ago, because it's crazy how much it stands out. My number two, let me just ask you, it's not a hot question, but you think of, you know, what is the meanest animal? You know what I mean? You think animal, you think, what would you say that comes to mind? Three, two, one. Orca whale. All right, well, you're both dumb, but that's okay. (laughs) Let me tell you this. What do you think about having a shark in a business suit on the front cover of a game? Look away, I'm close. I was about to yeah, I was almost said, did say shark for what it's worth, so that would have been great. Yeah, well, you almost said it. I he said genuinely. Orca whale. All right. Oh, my God. That is besides the point. Um, <laughs> this game is called Shark. It features a literal shark in a business suit on the front. What I love about this is this is a old game from the 80s that actually has a really funny Dice Tower review from Mr. Vassal, like old school, old, old school. And it is being republished now. It's sitting at 6.6 on BGG, and it is described as very, very mean acquire, which I'm like, okay. holy shit, old game, you know, right? Still sitting at a good... For a, a, a really conflict-heavy game, to have a 6.6 is actually good because of the multiplayer solitaire masses. Like That's a good enough score for being such a direct conflict game. From the 80s, a little bit more rules development, perhaps, for this new version that's coming out. And it's got a <laughs> shark on the front in a business suit. <laughs> mean uh, acquire? Are you kidding me? Somebody in my game group out here has the old version of this game. Oh really? I have think, you? Yeah. Uh, have you had a chance? I've to not. Play? No, I've not. But uh, you've now really piqued my interest in suggesting that for the next time we play. Wow. Well, okay. you don't don't play the old one from the '80s. We got a new one. Okay. Coming okay. out. We got to get the new one, and we got to play it. That's true. Agreed. Agreed. He's got a fucking cigar. Okay. <laughs> I didn't notice that until now, but <laughs> think about right. that, Mark. No, I, I had two. not considered that. I had not. Considered I, I'm that. just su- the only thing that's surprising to me is that this isn't my number one. Right. Well, I can't wait for your number this one. Is number two, yeah. My number two most anticipated game is Tindaya. This is kind of a weird one because on some level, this kind of sets off some alarm bells in my brain where it's designed to be both 
cooperative and competitive and have a trader mode. And I'm just a little bit like, okay, pick a lane there. Well, how's it going to work best? But let's start with the cooperative mode, right? So the idea is that you're all tribes on this island, which, you know, a modular board, you have sort of asymmetric powers and there are natural disasters coming in. And, you know, I'm going to sort of equate this a little bit to Spirit Island for whichever reason is the, the game that's most coming to my head, where you have this idea of what the disaster coming up is, right? And you're able to use your powers, give gifts to the gods, appease them in order to protect your tribe from the disasters before they happen you're going to try to keep doing this to survive all the just different waves of stuff that's hitting your tribes as the game progresses and theoretically as a cooperative game what you're trying to do is just collectively keep all of your tribes alive but i'm told that this is primarily designed for the competitive mode like that sounds intriguing all of its own but the competitive mode kind of just takes that same twist where it becomes a little bit semi-cooperative, where you're trying to help all the tribes at the table, but help your tribe maybe just a little bit more than other people. And whoever's tribe is able to sort of survive to the end while also being the one, you know, more effectively utilize their resources is the one that's going to win. So there was something I thought was quite interesting about that. I think that, the, again, the production of this looks lovely. It seems to have a lot of variability in terms of having different tribe powers, a la Spirit Island, different variable setups. It seems like there was just a lot of different game in the box, and we haven't even like gotten into the potential of a traitor mode, which you know is something I'm always interested by again whether or not that works well who can say but yeah very interested to see how all of this stuff shakes up in tendaya it just sounds like you described archipelago yeah uh, with that's exactly what i was thinking of. i mean actually yeah. Not, yeah i'm not even thinking about it i think the idea is that like the crises as it were are less like economic oriented so much as just like yeah. potentially more on the board as it were but yeah no you're not wrong there is definitely maybe something to that so there is a pure competitive versus pure co-op version of the uh, a way to play it? Yeah, the, the competitive is it seems like it's more just like a twist on the rule set of cooperative where you know if you're doing the game better than the other people at, at the table then that's the win condition, but that does seem to be how it's designed around theoretically. Gotcha. That is Tindaya by Red Mojo. My number 2 most anticipated game is one that I'm worried is going to fall into the same hole that I got tricked into by Newton, which was a game that I anticipated a couple of years ago from Essen that I ended up playing and not really loving so much. But it's the historical theming of it that is the hook for me with Lacrimosa, which is about trying to complete Wolfgang Mozart's last piece, which I guess was called the Requiem. So a couple of things hooked me with this. First, the cover shows like Mozart in the throes of this this incredible piece he's working on. And it's a very like striking piece of art for, for somebody who is like into history. And then also the historical theme of it. And the idea that the theme of this game is you're trying to help complete this last work of his, but you're doing it along two timelines. There's like a past timeline and a present timeline and in the past i guess you're helping him work on it and in the present you are commissioning other artists or musicians to complete the missing parts just an interesting take on that theme and the board looks sort of busy in all the ways i like a euro game to be it looks like there's a lot going on a lot of things to consider it just has a little bit of a like an old school euro palette to it that i like it just feels like hopefully a like midweight euro with an interesting theme and again like the past and present aspect of it feels like a twist you might not expect from euro games or a midweight euro so just a lot that is sort of bread and butter that i'm hoping uh, all pans out and that is lacrimosa by gerard Asensi and fernand bernalius all right mark you're hosting this one right i am this is drum roll Number one, it's time for the number one. Number one number space is one, time, is money, one, is power. Is money. Number one game of SN 2022, Kellen. Number one, one, number one. All right. Wow, I'm pumped, Mark. Thank you. That's right. You're welcome. That's why I'm hosting. Yeah, you you, I didn't even uh, have to ask. No prompting, um, yeah. So, for whatever reason. This is the number one game from Kellen for SN 2022. I'm, coming do, up I'm doing caveat right now, now for you. I'm bringing people down. Okay, whatever. Okay, so... World premiere. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is uh, too hype. Uh, so, w for whatever reason, there are these games that just intrigue you, stick with you, even the when they're a little... The most intriguing game of 2020. Oh <laughs> even, 
even when they're a little out of form or out of character for you. And for whatever reason, it's not even the art of this game that does it for me. I don't know what it is, but I've had it pre-ordered at Game Nerds for like three months, and I just keep hoping it'll ship. I have no idea why. Well, I, I mean, I know more about the game than no idea. But this is coming to us from uh, publisher Super Meeple. The game is called Virtue. Again, another one that I don't know how to pronounce because there's no E on the end of Virtue, and the U has an acento on it, so Virtue. This is a Euro rondelle game where you are buying cards and upgrading your rondelle i believe your rondelle only has like five or six spaces in it and you know it's been compared in some of the comments to like a dominion but you're putting the cards on your space choosing whether to go one or two spaces each next turn but it is physically attractive i like the idea of that sort of rondelle there's nothing in the rules and i've read through the rules that is immediately like this is new But there's something about the combination here that I'm just really eager and keen to try. In reading through a bunch of reviews of the game as well, one of the things I really like is that there apparently you can't win if you don't like attack. Some of the negative reviews are like, I wanted to explore a peaceful strategy, but I'm not able to in this game, which I love. And overall, it just feels like that mix of Euro game, but still quite confrontational and how it sort of plays out for me that reading through this rule book, I just get jazzed about trying this. The length is also right for me at what looks to be sub two hours. At three players, they're saying with experience, it's about an hour. So my guess is two hours right for the first play. I can't quite articulate everything that I'm excited about here, but there's just something here. I just want this game. And like harkens back to how I felt like 10 years ago when I didn't know as much about board games. I just want it. I look at, it's not even the cover because there's better covers. I just want it. Yeah. This was not on my radar at all, but your description and now looking over pictures of it, I am very excited about this one as well. Yeah, this is one that I definitely want to play too. It's so hard. It's like trying to describe like fun. I'm trying to sort of talk around all the reasons. I've read the rule book. There's the rondelle of it and upgrading your rondelle. It's just, it's like, it's all there for me. I'm excited to give this a try. Neil, and how do you pronounce this game? How do you spell it? V I R T U with an acento sobre la u. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say v v v two. I don't know. Oh my god! Try saying all five of my games fast. I have <laughs> no idea. This is Virtue Virtu. Very excited for this one. First time designer as well, which isn't always always fun to support. My most anticipated game is called Revive. This is from a team of four different designers, some of whom have some very cool credits to their names, stuff like Magnificent, Santa Maria, Escape of all things, Capital Lux, and publisher Aporta Games. And what I love about this is it just seems like very theme forward. So the premise of the game is that we're sort of in a post-apocalypse world that's frozen over and you are the tribes of a post-apocalypse civilization trying to rebuild by exploring outwards through a literal exploration mechanic of like flipping tiles getting resources discovering new technology building machines which it just seems like it's something that is while very euro with a sort of a puzzle action board mechanic which seems intriguing still just seems like very on the board you know like having your tribes on this map that you're moving out to placing buildings discovering new technology there just kind of seems a lot there that i'm really really excited about the look of this game is also stunning i love the card art i just love the way that this production looks one of the things i'm always intrigued by but i feel like every time a game does this i'm a little bit scared about is that it's also designed where you know similar to something that alexander fista has been experimenting with you uncover mechanics and more to it by playing the game over a series of a very short campaign which is sort of built into the core of the game whereby you slowly unveil the things that the game sort of has to offer mechanically i haven't seen a game necessarily pull that off especially well yet but i still want to see it work i want to see it succeed i love games that tutorialize themselves especially in the context of just being over a small number of games rather than a much longer campaign every faction has asymmetric powers and a sort of a distinct player board i'm just intrigued by this i love the way it looks that is revive it's like, does this game have a campaign? 
The answer is yes. Just leave out page 10 of the rule book. Any game, you can do this. Just leave out the last page of the rule book. You know, and then yeah. over the course of four plays, you read more and then exactly. you keep playing. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. My number one game shares a lot with Kellen's number one game, I think. This is another heavy sort of game that is has a sh- sort of short run time. This is Pilgrim by Spielworks and designer Nick Case, whose previous work I'm not familiar with, but Spielworks is the publisher sort of along the lines of Capstone, where whenever they have a game in the pipeline, I'm curious about it. So Pilgrim is, as the title might suggest, a game where you play as abbots and abbesses, where you are... Excuse me? (laughs) You play as the old school calculators? That's right, exactly. But what it promises is like a Macaulay sort of movement mechanism with an 18xx style board development tile development and so that was sort of an interesting aspect of it but the couple sentences they have here the description from the designer is what sort of hooked the line for me here so it says pilgrim is a game over 26 rounds with perfect information zero randomness once the game starts and here it is 160 sextillion possible starting setups isn't that interesting oh dear (laughs) So so far, Kellen is off, right? You're out. You're out at this point. No, I'm still. I'm still here. Okay. I had this here on my short list. Here you go. Here you go. Here's where you're back in. All right. Player interaction is intense and constant. Perfect. The meek might inherit the earth, but you will need to be made of stronger stuff to become the next cardinal and win the game. So just a lot of disparate things that I like. Moncala is, a, is an interesting mechanism. 18xx boar building is an interesting aspect to it. I'm a fan, if it's not done too dryly, of games with perfect information and, and no randomness. But it also is offering or promising this like really intense I- interaction. So just a lot of weird ingredients that are not necessarily often mixed together that seem to be in this game. And that's why I've got Pilgrim as the number one game on my most anticipated list of SN 2022. I saw the 18xx mark and I, I knew I knew it was Mark Bait. There were a lot of other 18xx games that I could have gone with, but this this just seems weird. It seems like a lot of like strange aspects, but when they are pushing this interaction as such like a headliner in the game was what really put it over top for me. Yeah, no, so, the, the central board is kind of cool as well. Yeah. Just, it, yeah, it looks cool. I want to try this. So that is going to do it for our countdown of our top five most anticipated games from SN 2022. If you've got games from SN that you're excited to play, or if you are going or have gone to Essen and uh, have games that you enjoyed, why not tell us? You can do that in a number of ways. You can find us on all forms of social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. You can join the Discord and go to boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord and go to our podcast channel where we talk about the current episode and maybe talk about the games, again, that you're most interested in in from Essen, maybe ones we've talked about, maybe ones that we uh, haven't talked about and should talk about. A couple years ago, we did our Essen preview and I missed City of the Big Shoulders. And one of our listeners, listener Nate, I think on our Discord told me about that. And he's the one who put it on my radar and became one of my favorite games of all time. So if you've got games that are going to be appearing in Essen that you think we might like, tell us there, tell us anywhere. And the Um, most direct route to do that is Mark Basada, text him at... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> other than Essen, if you're going to be at Shucks, the other convention, again, you can find us. I won't go over the scheduling again, but if you're at Shucks, you can just pick up one of the schedules and find out. We're going to be there the entire time, but we'll be on stage again, the main stage. Look at all the stages. Look at the biggest stage, and that's the one we're going to be on Friday night and then parts of Saturday. Um, for those who are patrons, and this is sort of Shucks adjacent, we just completed the Shucks math trade, and I'm going to be recording a Mark Talking Trades. This is probably going to be the biggest Mark Talking Trades, because I have not looked at the trades I've made, but I know that I've made a bunch of trades, and so I'm super, super excited to record that. That's going to be a patron only episode that's going to be releasing within the next day or two for sure, because I can't wait to record it. So look forward to that. As always, a big thank you to Heart Society for our intro and outro song, What's On Your Mind, Kid? And until next week, which will be uh, us joined alongside the one and only Tom, if everything goes well at the convention, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. You got to hit record here. 2.45. 2.45, okay. Okay, I'll hit record here. That's a good number, Mark, that we're giving you. Yeah, I know I like it.
Yeah, we, you get the it's two, and then it's double to the four, and then you just step up five, oh, and you wow, also got yeah, the five we, zero thing at the end. What is this? We usually save the good numbers like this for calendar. Calendar. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you crash your Scion yeah. going a hundred miles an hour there, Mark, with all the numbers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready to go. Oh, let's yeah, copy. Okay. You cop. Yeah. Three. Kellen, you ready? You're not holding anything. Three. I, I was trying to take a drink, you know, like a classy <laughs> gentleman, but of course, yeah, I'm ready. Clear the pipes. You clear the pipes. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Originally published in 2009 by Wolfgang Senker and Rolf Zur Lind, and published by Franjos Spiel Spiel of Vag. Spiel of Log. Spiel Spiel of Log. Spiel Spiel Nail what it. are you doing? Shut up. Shut up. Spiel, because I want to respect this company's name. Spieliver Log. There you go. I'm going to use that. Here we go. Okay. So Finca is a game. That was a lot of respect. 